Welcome back. Eric Rex did again. Let's continue our extension of sampling principles to go from plot sampling to distance sampling. Notice I've redrawn the diagram that we saw before. Same number of dots, same number of green rectangles with a subtle difference. So we now have extended the idea of plot sampling to include the possibility that not every animal inside our plots are detected by us. If you look closely at that plot, you'll see not only red dots inside the green boundaries, but also a few black dots. Those are animals that lived inside our study area that we didn't detect. So we've now relaxed the assumption that we employed previously, namely that everything inside our covered region was detected by us. So we've now made the strips a bit wider because we don't have to bring our effort in close to us to live up to the assumption that we see everything inside the strip. Because our strips are wider, our effort is extended, we have a bigger size study area over which we detect animals. Little a is now 1,000 instead of 500. And so little a over cap a, instead of being 1 tenth, is now going to be 1 fifth. In addition to that, we also see more animals than we saw previously. Previously, when we had done plot sampling on this area, we had seen 36 individuals in our covered region. We now see 68 individuals in our covered region. Note, I'll leave this for you to ponder, the number of animals that we see now is not quite double the number of animals that we saw previously even though our strip widths are exactly doubled. I wonder why that might be. So we now find ourselves in a situation where because we don't know the proportion of animals in our covered region that we see, we have to guess what the proportion of animals detected in our covered region really is. So we're going to use the notation P sub A to indicate the proportion of animals in the covered region little a that we detect. For the moment, let's operate under the belief that someone told us that p sub a was 0 0.7. If we had that piece of information, how would we proceed? We would proceed by taking the number that we saw along with the estimated proportion seen and use that estimated proportion seen to scale up the number that we saw to account for the number that we didn't see. So we then produce this estimate of 97.1 as the number of animals that inhabited the area that we covered, even though we didn't see all of them. Once we have that piece of information, we then need to do the second step, which is to scale up from the area that we did sample to incorporate even the areas that we didn't sample. Notice I mentioned to you earlier that we've now sampled a fifth of the study area. And so to scale up our estimated number in the covered region to account for over the entire study area, we produce this new estimate of 485. 485 is also not equal to 412, which is the number of animals that we know are in the study area based upon our census. So we now have a new estimator or a new formula that we can apply to try to estimate population size when we have line transect sampling in which we don't assume that we see everything. The only change that we've made is in this numerator. We now have to adjust the number seen in our survey to account for incomplete detectability inside our covered region. 
We rearrange this by taking the piece of A down, bringing the cap A up to produce this estimator of population size, plugging in the values that we discussed earlier, we produce our estimate of 485. So the concept that's central to understanding how distance sampling works is to recognize that it's a two-step process. Just as plot sampling was a two-step process, with one important distinction. In distance sampling, n sub a is no longer known to us, but rather it's estimated, so it has to carry a hat. The uncertainty associated with the estimation of the number of animals in our covered region is derived from, or propagates from, uncertainty associated with the estimation of what proportion of the animals in our covered region we see. So we estimate P sub A, use it to adjust our counts to produce estimates of the number of animals in our covered region. Given estimates of the number of animals in our covered region and the assumption of random line placement, we use a design-based estimator to scale up the number of animals in our covered region to the number of animals in our entire study area. The distinction now is that we have to estimate P sub A, which we assumed previously was equal to 1 when we did the strip transect, transect sampling I showed you earlier. So now the mystery is associated with the way in which we estimate the proportion of animals in our covered region that we saw. We need new information. The new information that we have has to come from collecting perpendicular distance data from our transect to the objects that we observed. My colleague, Dave Miller, has an alternative view of this in which, this is on our distancesampling.org website, by the way, in which he shows the process of performing distance sampling as walking along the red line, seeing dots left and right of that transect line, and recording those perpendicular distances. And it's the shape of the distribution of those perpendicular distances that we'll use to try to estimate P sub A. Back to our slides. So we want to estimate P sub A given this information about the distribution of those perpendicular distances from the transect. What we want to do is we want to take that distribution, that histogram of perpendicular distances and try to fit a curve to it. Furthermore, we're going to assume that we see everything that is at distance zero from the transect line. That would be here. All right. If we saw everything, not only on the transect line, but at all perpendicular distances, all the way out to that truncation distance w, then the histogram that we create when we look at the distribution of our detection distances ought to mimic this blue rectangular box. So as I say, if we saw everything at all distances, all of those histogram bars should be up at the blue line. But they're not. Why is it that they're not? Well, we have this area, this region, which is animals that we missed, animals that were undetected by us, even though they resided inside that region that we sampled. So 
the two pieces of information that are represented by the blue box and the red line give us that information that we need to try to estimate piece of A, proportion, probability of an animal inside our covered region being detected by us. It's the ratio of the area under the red curve to the area under the blue rectangle that give us an estimate of piece of A. If those histogram bars remained high for a very long distance away from the transect line and only started to diminish at great distances, then the area under the curve would be very close to the area under the rectangle, in which case P sub A would be very close to 1, meaning we saw almost everything. In contrast, if those histogram bars started to fade away very quickly, then the area under that red curve would be very small in relationship to the area of the rectangle, implying that P sub A was very small, implying that we saw a very small fraction of the animals that were actually inside our covered region. So we can calculate the area of the rectangle again using simple geometry. The distance between the transect line and the furthest most detection is 2. The height in this case is 12, so that's the area of the rectangle. The area under the curve could be calculated by taking the integral of that curve. We can approximate that integral by simply taking the height of the midpoint of each of those bars and multiplying each of those heights by the width of those bars and coming up with a set of eight areas that represent the areas depicted by these dotted lines. Summing up all eight of those areas produce an estimate of the area under the curve. The ratio then of the area under the curve to the area under the rectangle gives us that mysterious quest for P sub A. So, it is the drop-off in our detected perpendicular distances fitted by something that we're going to call a detection function that gives us information that we need to try to estimate this scaling factor that tells us about the proportion of animals inside our covered region that we detected. That's the fundamental feature of distance sampling that makes the if possible to estimate population size. All right, let's return back to the main topic today, which was to try to estimate population size in animal populations. So we're going to look at a few applications of distance sampling. There's distance sampling applied to transects. That's what I've showed you thus far. But you can also apply transect sampling to points where you stand, where an observer stands at a point, detects objects out to some distance, radial distance, and detects some and misses some. So we have point transects as well as line transects. Our distance measures can be either perpendicular distances or Again, using trigonometry, we can estimate angles and radial distances and use that to create the shape of our histogram. The data that we collect in the field can either be exact distances to the object, often done using a laser rangefinder as depicted here. Sometimes it's not possible to measure those distances exactly and we have to record the distance intervals. Here are wing struts of an airplane and knowing the height that the airplane, at which the airplane is flying allows us to convert those wing strut measurements into distance bins and we can analyze data that way. Another distinction in the type of data that we collect is the distances I'm sorry, 
We might collect distances to individual animals if individuals exist as loners. Alternatively, the data might be collected in clusters. If the animals tightly cluster together, we measure the distance to the center of that cluster. And in addition to that, we then try to estimate the size, the number of individuals, in the clusters that we sample. Another type of distance sampling that we can apply, we can apply distance sampling to the animals themselves. So we try to detect the animals, an elephant in this case, measure the distance to the elephant, use that perpendicular distance information to estimate population size. An alternative to that is to estimate density of things the animals leave behind. This is elephant dung. We can estimate density of animal dung and then convert that density of dung into density of animals by estimating things like deposition rate and decay rate. The advantage of estimating density of dung is that dung cannot run away from you and dung is stationary. However, there are, other, there are costs associated with each benefit. A Q count is also a type of indirect estimation. You're measuring density of songs of birds or blows of whales and then converting that density of song into a density of animals, taking into account the rate at which those cues are produced. There are also active methods of collecting data, whereby individual observers go into the field. Increasingly, it's becoming more likely that um, data are being collected by remote means, in which we put something like microphones into the field, leave them for some length of time, and then collect data that those microphones collect for subsequent analysis. So, thus far, we've gotten ourselves to the point where we can estimate either abundance, cap N, or density, cap D, in the context of plot sampling, in which we see everything inside the places where we visit, or adjusting for imperfect detectability we then come up with this, we have to come up with an estimate of P sub A that we use to adjust the number of things seen in our strips for incomplete detectability. And we use the shape of the histogram of our perpendicular distances to help us estimate P sub A as the ratio of the area under the curve to the area of the rectangle.